so welcome everyone to today's webinar topic, generating leads legally, regulatory and litigation quick hits. My name is Alex McGarris. I am joined by two of my partners, Dan and Jonathan. Um, and before we get started, just some housekeeping. First, um, we are making CLE credit available um, for today's session. We will provide a code in the middle of the presentation that you can use to get CLE in the um, appropriate jurisdictions. Um, and first, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleagues um, who will be talking to you today about lead generation and the regulatory issues that those in the uh, lead generation industry face, especially in the current um, regulatory environment. First um, is Dan Blinn. Dan focuses his practice on false advertising and telemarketing litigation. Known as the Bo Jackson of the law, he has a robust litigation practice, in particular in uh, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act area, but also provides counseling to brands and lead generation companies alike. And uh, we all use uh, his expertise in this area, um, and he'll be providing insights on uh, telemarketing and the TCPA more specifically. I'm Alex, partner in our New York office. Uh, my practice generally um, focuses on defending government investigations, primarily um, brought by the Federal Trade Commission and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau across industries, but typically where advertising and consumer financial uh, products intersect. And then last but not least, uh, Jonathan Pompan is joining us. He is the chair of our Consumer Financial Protection Services Practice Group. Uh, like me, Jonathan defends companies in investigations brought by uh, regulators, including the CFPB, FTC, and state financial regulators. Uh, Jonathan also um, has a robust compliance practice in all areas relating to consumer financial services. Today's webinar, um, as I noted at the top, um, will be about um, the lead generation industry and the various um, kind of hot areas of uh, legal compliance um, that companies that both generate and sell leads, aggregate um, leads, um, and that purchase leads need to be aware of. Um, all of these um, areas intersect, um, and as we'll discuss um, throughout the course of the presentation, um, Regulators have been taking a pretty holistic look at the regulatory uh, requirements when um, examining the practices of companies in this area, and in particular, um, scrutiny on how leads um, for lead buyers, how leads were generated, and what knowledge the lead purchasers have of those various practices. So first, Jonathan will give a, um, a table setting on the legal and regulatory landscape for acquiring customers. Um, we'll then turn it over to Dan to do a little bit of a deep dive on the TCPA specifically. Um, we thought that would be a good place to start because we know it is a source of a lot of stress for companies in this area, given how much it's litigated and recent developments that impact the litigation risk there. We'll then uh, cover federal and state regulatory developments, um, primarily focusing on what the FTC and CFPB have been up to, which should serve as a blueprint um, on what to expect going forward. Uh, Jonathan will then uh, touch on um, the way that these same regulators have been responding to innovation in the industry, um, particularly how artificial intelligence and algorithms are used in decision-making um, for purposes of uh, matching or connecting customers to products and services which of course um, you all in lead generation are central to. Um, and finally, we will cover some practices, strategies for um, maximizing compliance and um, please ask us questions. Uh, there's a chat feature that allows you to do that. We'll try to get to them uh, at the end if we don't hit them throughout the course of our presentation. And so with that, I'll turn the mic over to Jonathan, who will cover um, the landscape um, and why this topic is, is so important 
Thank you, Alex. And again, uh, welcome everyone. We appreciate you spending your afternoon with us or watching this recording if uh, you're watching it on YouTube. Lead generation has uh, existed really uh, since the beginning of any advertising and marketing as a, a strategy. The legal uh, and regulatory landscape for customer acquisition, though, of course, has uh, dramatically changed in recent years. And obviously, with the advent of uh, mobile marketing and other forms of electronic communication and uh, digital communication and advertising and marketing that's gone along with that. But lead generation, of course, can go all the way back to the days uh, of the catalog sales uh, and, of course, uh, telemarketing. And even before that, um, the idea of a finder um, going out uh, and perhaps uh, connecting somebody uh, that's interested in a particular product or service, um, and that person makes an inquiry about it. Um, so, of course, advertising and marketing are concepts that are important here. Advertising and marketing, though, is not always lead generation. Um, but for today's purposes, importantly, lead generation that we're going to be discussing is the process of identifying and cultivating individual consumers who are potentially interested in purchasing a good or service. And that goal, of course, of somebody who's engaged in lead generation is to connect companies with persons who want their uh, product or service um, to make an effective sale um, and to satisfy the consumer's inquiry. Sometimes, of course, it could be just simply information that's requested. Now, importantly, uh, lead generation continues to be a hot button topic for regulators uh, on all fronts. And uh, today's uh, session is gonna in particular focus on lead generation, oftentimes in the online setting, um, although perhaps also with the telemarketing component. Um, but oftentimes lead generation can exist in other forms as well. We're gonna touch on some of that as also. Now, the legal and regulatory community um, is well aware of what lead generation is, and the various federal agencies that are focused on lead gen um, range from the Federal Trade Commission to the state's attorneys general, and uh, also, of course, functional regulators for the product or service that may be being marketed. So as we show here on the next slide, there are any number of functional regulators, say, for instance, if it's uh, Social Security disability leads, could be the Office of Inspector General at SSA. Uh, you could be the Department of Education if it is private sector college and university leads. Um, obviously, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau if it's a consumer financial product or service. And then uh, state financial services regulators for products that are financial products and services regulated by state regulators, in some cases, obviously overlap with federal. And then, uh, you know, for online lead gen for lawyers, there's state courts that govern attorney ethics and advertising and marketing by attorneys. There's insurance regulators. There's uh, even in some states uh, various requirements around home services. Uh, and so on. So depending on what the product or service is, there's an entire body of law that will apply to that, that will be relevant to lead gen. Um, but the multiple sources of federal and regulatory scrutiny, um, as well as on the state level, um, is not a small number. Today's session, of course, is going to focus on the sort of the top agencies that are relevant, the Federal Trade Commission, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, because we know from seeing the sign up that many of you are involved in consumer financial products and services. It's also perhaps the most uh, well represented market in the uh, consumer financial services advertising space and lead gen, um, quite popular. But we also know that there's home services, uh, anything from uh, solar to generators to air conditioners and handyman, uh, pest control, all engage in lead generation activity. We see also on today's uh, attendee list, uh, many other forms of uh, products and services represented by the companies. And uh, many of the lessons and discussion today is gonna be applicable. Now, when we talk about the Federal Trade Commission, uh, importantly, we're talking about um, a new FTC. Uh, within the last year, there's been a radical shift in the makeup of the Federal Trade Commission, which is a five member uh, commissioner organization. Um, appointed by the president, reflective of the political party of the president as well. 
And in this case, um, a relatively new chair who's been on the job for less than a year, uh, Lena Khan. Um, and she is approaching regulation through the Federal Trade Commission on the consumer protection front um, in a very aggressive and, and progressive manner in a way that we and really no one has seen before in terms of marshalling the resources. We'll be discussing today any number of initiatives uh, by the Federal Trade Commission, how they intersect with Legion. We've highlighted a couple on our slide. And in particular, uh, there's a focus on individual, holding individuals accountable and investors. There's been a um, firm and uh, uh, frequent statements um, that um, mirror those of the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Roe Chopra. And uh, there's also um, a, several regulatory developments as well at the FTC, including, for instance, the safeguards rule that takes effect uh, later this year um, that will affect finders uh, for consumer financial products. So there's a lot of activity at the Bureau, I mean, uh, at the Commission rather. And uh, also too, if we look back historically, um, and we'll show many of these today, a lot of the enforcement examples uh, for lead gen specifically, um, where there's a lead gen company involved, come directly from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, but there are other players in town as well, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau being a, a close second, um, where again, a relatively new director, Rohit Chopra, who's been making headlines uh, in any number of ways, um, going big, announcing a big market inquiries of fintech and payment services and a variety of other fintech related initiatives. He's also uh, been uh, very active in essentially chiding industry for hiring former CFPB attorneys um, and seeking uh, engaged counsel who, who know the space um, because he's trying to separate the agency from any bias uh, or any legacy uh, past activities in, in that regard. He's also big on focusing on alternative uh, data, the use of big data in credit decisions and uh, AI and machine learning. And then like Lena Khan, he is also voiced and uh, there's uh, past uh, evidence of this as well now, of uh, a focus on holding individuals accountable, um, whether that be control persons within an organization, uh, members of the executive team or boards of directors, or even investors. Um, and we expect uh, quite a lot in that regard from the CFPB during his tenure. And uh, most uh, notably this week, even already an announcement of the uh, Bureau moving into position to regulate further uh, non-bank organizations through supervision and examination um, that were not otherwise covered uh, by that process that was set up over eight to nine years ago at the CFPB. So there's a lot of developments. We'll be discussing many of them and how they reflect on the lead generation community. Jonathan, if, if I may, there is um, one point I wanted to flush out further that you know, we won't be covering later in the presentation, and that relates to um, the FTC's you know, revival of its penalty offense authority, which we have um, listed in one of the bullets here. Um, the reason this is important is because two of those notices, which I'll discuss, I'll describe what that means, um, very much um, impact this industry. And so until a year ago, um, April, 2021, um, FTC has long relied on Section 13B of its organic statute to seek remedies um, in court, directly in court, including monetary relief from, from companies um, it concluded had engaged in unfair or deceptive acts and practices. Um, this practice went on for decades. Many courts um, agreed with the FTC's position that it can go directly into federal district court to obtain monetary relief for consumers. Um, and then a year ago, the Supreme Court unanimously, which is um, of course not something we see too often anymore, held that 
Section 13B of, of the FTC Act does not empower the FTC to get monetary relief. Um, and this case, which was of course widely covered is the AMG Capital case and really um, shook kind of how the FTC brings its cases. But as a result in the last 12 months, the FTC has um, been able to pivot and change um, the way it brings cases by relying on other um, you know, parts of the Federal Trade Commission Act that give it you know, different avenues for pursuing defendants, some of which require the FTC to jump through additional hoops, which is why they, you know, they have been um, relying so heavily on, on Section 13B. But, but they've, they've gone ahead and, and taken steps um, to allow themselves to do that. And, and one of those um, measures um, the FTC is now using to, to compensate for um, the stripping of its 13B power is its uh, penalty offense authority. And that is um, something that is, um, has not been used um, in decades by the FTC, but essentially um, the FTC Act um, allows for um, the FTC to seek civil penalties um, for um, any company that it can prove um, knew that a conduct or a practice was unfair or deceptive um, and that the FTC had already written or issued a written decision in another case involving different parties that that same conduct is unfair and deceptive. Um, so the, the challenge with that provision and that authority is that the FTC has a, a pretty high burden to prove that the company or defendant had actual knowledge of the conduct of that you know, prior decision where the FTC concluded that such conduct was either unfair and or deceptive. Um, so to kind of trigger that authority, um, the FTC has decided to issue a series of notices to very specific companies. The list of companies that received um, one of these notices is long. I think it's over 2,000 companies long. Um, and basically, it, it set forth um, in very broad terms a series of practices, um, business practices that it considers to have been, you know, it decided in prior cases are um, illegal. And one of those relates to for profit colleges and institutions. And so more than 70 of those institutions received one of these notices. Um, and um, among the list of things that the FTC has put them on notice as being illegal is uh, misrepresenting the demand for graduates um, in a specific industry and misrepresenting employment prospects, graduation rates, um, qualifications to obtain employment, et cetera. The types of statements and claims that are very often made in advertising for for-profit colleges and universities. And therefore, each of these companies that has received one of these letters is now potentially subject to civil penalties of over $40,000 per violation if it or one of its service providers um, engages in one of those listed conducts. Um, and we have a similar um, notice of penalty offense that went to over 700 companies that relates to deceptive endorsements and testimonials, um, pretty much all advertising for any sector and industry involves the use of endorsements and testimonials, but certainly, um, you know, they are used in, in generation of leads for education, insurance, financial services, et cetera, which um, many, uh, many uh, representatives on, the, on this webinar are involved in. And so this resurrection of this authority um, is potentially um, a very big deal. It remains to be seen. Um, the FTC itself hasn't brought any lawsuits, but it, set, it has been setting the groundwork um, this, over the last 12 months to bring these types of cases um, in order to uh, deal with um, the loss in the AMG case. And similarly, um, well, we will talk a little bit in specificity about what dark patterns means. Um, this is something that the FTC 
and, and now the CFPB have been um, harping on um, and dark patterns um, essentially mean website designs and features um, that steer or manipulate or trick customers into taking action on websites that it didn't intend to do. Um, and in particular, the FTC has called out practices regarding you know, labeling of hyperlinks, labeling of call to action buttons, the way funnels and website flows work as um, potentially deceptive steering or manipulation of customers. And we'll get into some specifics there, but it's a heavy focus um, of the agency um, and it's, it will continue to be uh, in the next two and a half years. And so with that, I think we will switch gears to talk about um, the TCPA and I'll hand the mic over to, to Dan. And after that, we will go back to some of these um, concepts that we just teased a little bit with respect to unfair deceptive acts and practices and lead generation. So with that, Dan, um, please, uh, please take the stage. Yeah, thanks Alex. And <clears throat> thank you all for joining us uh, today. Um, at the outset of the webinar, Alex said that I'd be doing a little bit of a deep dive into the TCPA. And I'm not sure that little bit and deep dive are, are coextensive, but um, I don't want to spend too much time on TCPA for two reasons. First of all, uh, we have about 35 minutes left. Um, and second of all, I will be, uh, uh, one, one of my colleagues and I will be giving a uh, TCPA and other telemarketing statute uh, deep dive uh, in July on, on another Venable webinar, so stay tuned. So with that, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a shallow dive into the TCPA and some of the uh, collateral issues that are, are most likely to, to affect uh, lead generators and the brands that buy leads. So first, let me talk about the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, um, the TCPA, or, or uh, depending on, on your view, uh, total cash for plaintiff's attorneys. Um, what this is, is a federal statute uh, that regulates outbound uh, calls, text messages, and faxes. Um, there are, uh, as I think of the TCPA, kind of two buckets of, of rules that you need to be aware of. Um, one is rules regarding auto dialing and the use of pre recorded messages. And the second bucket are do not call rules. Um, there are some other issues uh, you see on the screen inaccurate caller ID, that's call spoofing, and the like. Um, uh, the TCPA um, is very important to anyone who engages with consumers using the phone. Um, it's, uh, it's enforced by the FCC and the FCC has levied uh, massive civil penalties and fines, uh, largely uncollected, uh, but probably most concerning for those on the phone are is the threat of private uh, uh, plaintiff class actions. And, and these can be pretty expensive uh, both to settle, I think the high watermark came in um, either this year, early this year, or I think it was last year, and it was just over, I think, $76 million to settle. Um, there have been two uh, class jury verdicts, one for $267 million and one for $925 million, all relating to fairly uh, narrow, discrete telemarketing campaigns. That's purely due to the draconian statutory penalties uh, or statutory damages associated with the TCPA, which are in the auto dialer and pre-recorded message context, $500 per text or call that violates the statute, uh, which can be troubled if a court finds that the, uh, the violation was willful, willful or knowing. And uh, you know what is willful or knowing? Courts are split on that. Some believe that it is willfully or knowingly violating the statute. Other courts take a broader view and say, you've willfully or, or knowingly violated the statute if you've willfully or knowingly um, sent the text message or placed the call at issue. Um, in the uh, do not call context, same sort of structure, uh, except instead of setting $500 as the floor, uh, it's up to $500 per violation. Um, and uh, that can be troubled as well. Um, Last year, uh, historically, most of the TCPA litigation has been auto dialer related. Um, that was due to uh, a, a deep circuit split um, on, on what is or is not an auto dialer. Um, some courts, 
the ninth, uh, second circuit, and uh, and uh, one other circuit, the sixth circuit, uh, had had previously taken the view that um, just dialing from a list of phone numbers without human involvement uh, uh, is auto dialing. Other courts took a more industry favorable view that um, uh, numbers must have been randomly or sequentially generated, essentially pulled out of thin air, and then dialed automatically. Um, to be an auto dialer. Therefore, dialing from a stored list itself is not auto dialing. Um, last April, in another uh, kind of surprising 9 nothing Supreme Court decision authored by Justice Sotomayor, um, the Supreme Court sided with uh, the second, um, uh, second, uh, third, and 11th circuits, or I'm sorry, second, seventh, and 11 circuits finding that um, auto dialing requires random or sequential number generation. So, if, if uh, you were to download the phone book, for example, that would, and, and then blast out a text message to everyone in the phone book, that would not be auto dialing under the Supreme Court uh, precedent because these are not randomly or sequentially generated phone numbers. Um, that's great if you buy lead lists. Um, a lot of the auto dialer cases have, have tapered off. Uh, where the plaintiff's bar has pivoted uh, is to uh, pre-record a message and do not call uh, cases um, at the federal level. Now, let me just, uh, even though I'm talking about TCPA and I think Jonathan might have a question or two for me, um, uh, there are a couple state laws that have much broader uh, auto dialer provisions than the TCPA. Florida is the primary uh, state telemarketing law on this. Uh, it was amended last July to allow for a private cause of action, uh, whereas historically for the last, uh, uh, 40 some odd years, um, it was uh, the Florida telemarketing law was enforceable only by the the uh, the state regulator in charge of uh, of, of telecommunications. Um, since July uh, last year, Florida courts, both federal and state courts, have been flooded with uh, uh, cases brought under the Florida the Florida Telephone Solicitation Act, alleging the use of an auto dialer without prior express written consent. Uh, there have been uh, over uh, well over a hundred of these filed. Um, they are largely still in their uh, uh, infant stages. Um, Oklahoma is about to uh, pass a law that's going to mirror Florida. So um, even though we're talking about TCPA primarily, be very aware of, of, of state laws as well. Um, uh, TCPA, uh, you know, to use a auto dialer um, or a pre-recorded message, um, you need a certain level of consent. Um, which differs depending on um, what kind of line you're, uh, you're calling or texting um, and, the, and the nature of the message. So if you are auto dialing and sending a pre, uh, a, uh, a marketing text message, sorry, my lights just went off. So um, we're setting the mood here. Um, you need a higher level uh, of consent. It's called prior express written consent that has uh, several rigid disclosures that must be present. You have to advise the consumer that uh, calls or text messages might be automated, that they might be marketing in nature, and that consent is not required to make a purchase uh, from the uh, from the uh, seller. Uh, for non-marketing communications um, that are auto dialed, or if there's a pre-recorded message, and these are I'm talking about cell phones now. There are different rules for uh, residential lines. Um, you need a uh, lower level prior express consent which is typically deemed to exist whenever a consumer provides uh, his or her phone number to you. Uh, consent does not expire on its own, it, uh, but it can be revoked. Um, uh, and importantly here, um, you know, for brands, they often think that if they engage a lead generator uh, to place uh, marketing calls that, you know, they're, uh, the brands are off the hook. The lead generators are the ones who can be held liable. And that's certainly true, true that a lead generator who violates the TCPA itself can be held directly liable. Um, there is a concept called vicarious liability that allows the brand itself to be uh, liable for lead generator violations of the, uh, of the TCPA, depending on whether or not the lead, generation, lead generators are acting as, um, as, as agents for the, uh, for the uh, brands. Um, let me stop there. I've been talking for about eight minutes, which is about the length of time um, for the uh, studio version of, of uh, Leonard Skinner's Freebirds. Uh, uh, Jonathan, do you have some questions for me? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, Dan, a common question we've been getting ever since the uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, do get uh, fit for Facebook, is whether or not there really is any need for anyone to be overly concerned about the, the auto dialer issue if they believe they're not using an auto dialer. Now, you highlighted Florida and uh, um, other states, um, but is the solution simply not to use an auto dialer or not to work in those states? So, right. Uh, the, the, the easy answer is, is yes. So at the TCPA level, very little now will be considered an auto dialer at the federal level. Um, there have been a couple of courts uh, that have pointed out that the random and sequential lead generation kind of technology went the way of the dodo in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, no one was just pulling numbers out of thin air anymore. It makes, it makes more sense to at least call numbers that you already have, theoretically targeting specific customers. So, you know, you don't see a lot of auto dialing cases anymore. Some plaintiffs have, uh, have, have tried to get creative and keep those cases alive by, um, well, by, by, by saying that, you know, uh, numbers on a stored list that happen to be uh, randomized, let's say, um, is auto dialing and, and courts have shut that down. Um, there was a poorly kind of drafted um, footnote in the uh, Supreme Court's do good decision that, that opened that door, but courts have kind of closed it. Right now, the auto dialer fight is at the state level, um, primarily in Florida. Um, these are uh, one of the slides uh, pointed out that, that uh, TCPA lawsuits are, are, you know, have fairly low uh, uh, pleading thresholds to, to, to get past the dismissal stage. And once you're past the dismissal stage, every plaintiff's attorney knows that the aggregated statutory damages <clears throat> can be bankrupting and, and they use that as, as a way to try to settle non-meritorious cases or impose uh, such risk on the defendant that, that they have to concede. Um, so yeah, the, the battle, that's a long way of saying the battle is at the state auto dialer level. But again, even at the federal level, there are a lot of do not call cases being filed and a lot of pre-recorded message cases being filed. Dan, on the, in terms of best practices, if you're a purchaser of leads and uh, let's, for the sake of argument, assume that you want to be purchasing inquiries that include some form of a phone contact, whether that be mobile or landline, might not even be known by anyone um, in, in the chain. Um, and perhaps, you know, the consumer um, is the only uh, party to that, as well as also obviously the, the databases that track that. But uh, what type of diligence should a purchaser be doing to protect themselves here? Um, can they simply rely upon the contract uh, that they'll uh, sign with the lead aggregator or generator? Or should they be looking behind the contract? Um they should certainly be looking behind the contract. So there, there, when I tell, when I, when my clients ask these questions, um, the, the broad kinds of best practices with the guy, without getting into too many details, um, when you're working with lead generators is, is first of all, know who you're working with. I mean, vet these lead generators, ask the uncomfortable questions. Um, have you ever been uh, investigated by a regulator uh, stemming from telemarketing complaints? Have you ever been sued under uh, the TCPA or a state telemarketing law? Um, how do you generate your leads? Are you texting? Are you placing calls? What kinds of policies and practices do you have in place? Are you training on them? So first of all, make sure you're dealing with reputable companies because you know, a lot of my clients think that having an indemnification clause in a contract with a lead generator is great. You know, if we're if 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 something goes awry, we can just have the lead generator indemnify us. Well, that's nice if then if the lead generator has a billion dollars. Most don't. A lot are small companies that are judgment proof. And then with vicarious liability, the the true liability shifts to the the brand. Um, but having contracts in place and contracts that require not just compliance with you know the TCPA the telemarketing sales rule, state and local telemarketing laws, et cetera, but actually requiring um, the lead generator to have prior express written consent or the, whatever the applicable level of consent may be 
uh, are important. There is a line of authority out there. Uh, there's a, a case out of uh, Massachusetts called McDermott. Um, there, there's a case out of the Seventh Circuit. The FCC has, has, has pointed this out in the facts and context, but the, there's a line of authority that essentially says if a lead generator has, if, if, a sell, if a brand has prohibited the lead generator from placing cold calls or calling consumers without prior express written consent, and the lead generator violates the TCPA without the, the brand knowing, well, then the brand has, has essentially had a, a fraud committed upon it and should not be held vicariously liable. And that kind of makes sense. You know, to, this, to the extent there is agency in the first place, the lead generator has, has blown through the scope of that agency. Um, there, there was another case called McCurley out of, uh, I think of the Southern District of California that reached that same conclusion. Um, it was reversed by the Ninth Circuit um, uh, about three weeks ago on April 5th. Um, the Ninth Circuit did not gut this contractual, you know, fraud on the seller defense. It simply said that in that case, the brand you know, should have been paying closer attention to and realized that there was a problem from the lead generator based on the number of warm transfers compared to the number of purchases. In that case, it, it was a, a cruise company that had engaged uh, a, a lead generator. The lead generator had transferred something like 2.1 million calls to the cruise company. And, and, and that's just transfers, that's warm transfers. So there are probably a lot more calls at issue. But of those 2.1 million transfers of highly interested consumers in theory, because these are folks who have provided prior express written consent, um, there were only, I think, 560 purchases of cruise tickets. And so the court said, you know, there's something odd here. You should have been on notice. And because, you know, of this, this poor ratio of, of warm transfers to purchases, you very well might have ratified the, the you know, independent contractor lead generators conduct and it sent the, the case back down to the, the district court. So those are, those are some of the things that, that brands should be doing. Um, lead generators themselves should be using um, lead forms uh, and, and other calls to action that identify who will be calling. A lot of lead generators operate in a vertical. Uh, one that, that's hot right now is, uh, uh, well, uh, cruises, uh, solar call, solar products and services calls, um, timeshares, those are always the, the ones that generate the most complaints. Um, but a lead generator might say, might have consent language on a lead form saying uh, to the effect, you know, you give consent to not just us, but, you know, our marketing partners and have a, a hyperlink to a hundred or a thousand marketing other companies. Um, that's usually not great. Um, you know, there, there are some F, FTC uh, guidance on lead sharing. Um, they want to see um, the names of the companies that to which the uh, consumer is providing consent and who might be calling in the disclosure itself. However, in a lot of cases, that might not be practicable. Uh, but rather than simply referring to a laundry list of, uh, of lead generator or companies that might be calling, um, you're supposed to advise of the potential number of callers or the potential potential number of calls, and there are other things like that 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 can be problematic. That's why, you know, fundamentally, the TCPA. I'll, I'll leave you with this: the TCPA is not a difficult statute to understand. There are just an awful lot of nuances, and it becomes a minefield. So, you know, engaging in a in a in a you know in, in an ounce of, of of prevention and compliance now can save you a pound of hurt later. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Actually, I think that. That dovetails perfectly into kind of the other issues that um, entities in this ecosystem need to be aware of. And, and primarily, these concepts of unfair and deceptive practices very much have to do with informed consent. Um, do the customers understand what they're signing up for when submitting their personal information in a, in a form and then get you know, contacted later? And so you know, the FTC has been um, all over this issue for many years, um, starting about 10 years ago, um, they began opening investigations to lead, um, more like the lead aggregators, and through those investigations, 
um, not just learned about that specific entity's practices and brought several lawsuits, but was getting information about all the companies that were selling and buying leads from that lead aggregator and starting to pursue um, those companies, um, you know, one by one, opening investigations. And but the, the settlements, and, and they all have been settlements, the settlements that have come out of these cases um, kind of have a single theme. Um, and that is that customers need to understand what they're entering their information for, what the offers are, and need to not be surprised when they get contacted. Um, and so as a, as a as kind of a, you know, fundamental um, principle guiding all advertising efforts, and, and when I say advertising, we're, you know, we're talking about banner ads, email ads, the websites themselves, the landing pages, the for- pages where the you know, lead forms live on, and any follow-up text messages or um, telemarketing calls that result from a customer submitting um, her information into a lead form, all of that need to be um, not confusing, of course, but also be very clear as to what offers the consumer is potentially going to be contacted about. Um, here on this page, this list um, several of the statutes and regulations that govern this area. Um, and of course, I just messed up the deck. Um, but most importantly, let's talk about a few of the cases that um, the FTC has brought the settlements um, and the complaints and you know, in particular, where the, the FTC lays out the conduct that it believes um, is deceptive, or in some cases unfair, or particularly um, illustrative. Um, one of the cases that's now several years old is the action brought against um, two companies that operated uh, many websites um, with the names like Army.com or ArmyEnlist.com, and the core allegations there were that um, you know every contact with the customer from you know banner ads or the search engine results and the headings in the results um, were designed to look like they were from official military recruiting channels. All of the you know terms that were bid on for uh, uh, SEO purposes, all of the results. In the search engine, uh, search in the, in the searches, all of the content on the landing page was about joining the military. The, you know, clearly the folks that were um, looking uh, and ended up on these landing pages were interested in potentially enlisting, and were looking to get additional information. So they were um, sucked in because they were seeing ads that suggested they would get information about benefits of being um, in the military, how to enlist in the military. But in fact, they were ending up on websites that were owned by private parties um, that were collecting and selling leads to post-secondary education, so colleges and universities. Um, and so the again, all of the content surrounding the form itself, all the other links on the web page were very um, you know, military service content heavy, but the actual purpose of, of, the, of, the, of the call to action of the, of the lead form was to collect information um, to recruit people to go to college. Um, and so the FTC brought the case saying that there was, you know, deception occurring from as soon as the customer entered search terms like, you know, how to enlist and getting back um, you know, results for army.com or enlist.com, which really was designed to generate leads for education. Um, as part of the settlement, these companies um, had to pay, um, I think it was an $11 million fine, but also had to give up the domain names um, to, the, to the FTC. So obviously assets that were um, very profitable. Another more recent case brought by the FTC that looks at from a different perspective 
the lead generation business is the um, Lend EDU case. Um, this is one of the websites that serve as a comparison site. Of course, this is um, a very popular you now business model. It's used you know, travel industry, personal finance, insurance, even, even consumer goods. You can um, shop and compare by, through these third-party independent websites. Um, the FTC alleged in this matter that, you know, LendEDU um, spent a lot of real estate on the website um, and suggesting that everything was um, independent, objective, not influenced by um, compensation or commissions that uh, the lenders in this case were paying lending to you. Um, there was an entire web page devoted to describing Lend EDU's methodology for how it ranked um, or rated the lenders that appeared um, on its web on its website, um, and it you know allocated what percentage was of the score or ranking was because of the terms of the of the of, of the loan, the customer service um, features um, of the company, etc. And absolutely, you know, nowhere was it obvious that, in fact, um, a lender's ranking um, and positioning on the website, including where it's a top, you know, nine list or a best, um, you know, be ten best lenders list. In fact, it, it was a, a pay-to-play opportunity. The more um, uh, a lender paid uh, per uh, click or per conversion. Um, the higher ranked they, they can get. And the FTC uncovered in its investigation as detailed in the complaint emails where representatives of the company, including executives, were telling lenders, if you want to increase your ranking, you have to pay X more uh, per lead. Um, and so as a result, um, you know, the company did have to pay um, restitution, but also it's now prohibited from making these types of misrepresentations. The, the, the real takeaway there is that it needs to be obvious and clear that um, if there's a, if, if how the rankings um, or ratings appearing on a comparison site are at all influenced by any, you know, by um, compensation or another type of material connection with um, the website operator that needs to be clearly and conspicuously and unavoidably disclosed to consumers. And I think the industry has definitely taken notice and seeing um, across the board disclosures to that effect um, on these websites, but you need to make sure that you're looking at um, your advertising holistically. It's not going to be sufficient to just have a hard to find disclosure or a separate you know, web page within a Web, you know, a complex website that provides additional information about how rankings work. If everything else on the site is suggesting that criteria is, is you know, based on is completely objective and based on, you know, editorial uh, decision making. And then finally, here's an example um, where. Um, uh, you know, Lending Club, which um, works with bank, partners with banks to, to fund loans, was, um, according to the FTC, um, making deceptive claims about, you know, fees when, and the advertising itself, um, you know, continually emphasized that there were no hidden fees and a customer um, would not kind of really realize that there was an upfront fee until she received her loan and would see that actually um, a percentage of the dispersed amount, amount of a loan um, had been taken up front as a fee, which would not have not been previously disclosed. Um, the bottom line with um, the FTC and um, lead generation is, uh, is you have to take a step back and look at um, each kind of interaction and touch with a consumer um, and make sure that um, throughout that journey um, the customer is not is not told that is not is not essentially um, confused or receiving misrepresentations about the ultimate product or service that she's going to be offered and that's particularly complicated when 
Um, you're generating leads for a number of companies that offer a variety of terms and therefore the advertising by definition needs to be generic. Um, and there are ways to do that that do not um, trip on um, kind of some fault lines with respect to deceptive um, conduct. There's also been a focus on small business um, financing by the FTC. The bottom line is if, if your, your products are really B2B, don't think that you're outside the scrutiny of the FTC or CFPB, that's, that's just not true. And the CFPB has also been very active in this space, um, although has generally been more interested um, in how consumers are um, steered towards um, either higher interest rate um, loans or loans that are, in the CFPB's view, um, void because they are made by an unlicensed uh, lender. Um, there, the CFPB is looking at how the decision making is made. This is like really the engine that drives. The, the matching um, between consumer and products to see if it's somehow abusive. And as Jonathan will describe, um, there's also um, a different additional areas where the CPD in particular is looking at um, sector specific statutes and how um, different entities in the lead generation ecosystem um, can, get, uh, can get it wrong. Thanks, Alex. And uh, for consumer financial products and service lead generators, uh, something to keep in mind, something we know the um, CFPB and actually the FTC as well uh, is interested in is uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Now, Fair Credit Reporting Act is a very large statute that covers all types of aspects of consumer reports um, that are used in the decision as to whether or not to extend credit. Certainly there's the use of consumer reports. There's also the collection of data um, that may be compiled and then turn the lead generator into a consumer reporting agency. So there's the duality of risks there. There's been enforcement with respect to the use or impermissible use in the case of the allegations of consumer reporting data uh, used in targeting for uh, lead generation and the resale of that data. And there's also uh, in the lending space in particular, a need to manage the risks of who's going to provide an adverse action notice uh, if credit is pulled. Now, the FCRA is not a consent based statute. So the consumer doesn't agree or, dis, uh, or to provide information or not. Um, the consumer reporting agencies collect that information regardless. But then that a, that information is protected, of course, by the FCRA, and the consumer is entitled to an adverse action notice uh, if the information is used uh, against them in a decision of credit. Now, how that adverse action notice is compiled, what is stated in it, uh, what reasons may be provided may differ based on the facts, but it's a key area to focus on for those involved in consumer financial services and lead gen. And before we move on, I want to make sure I give you the CLE code uh, today's code is the word compliance. Now, in addition, uh, the FTC uh, has announced that there is a uh, and has published a new uh, safeguards rule that changes the game for lead generators with in terms of consumer financial services and products. Specifically, singles out finders, which of course, could be lead generators, maybe others, um, and will require those organizations to implement um, a set of compliance requirements, as well as also the typical contractual protections that have always been in place to comply with the safeguards rule. Importantly, uh, they need to, uh, anyone who falls under this requirement will have to essentially identify and designate a qualified individual to be responsible for the program regularly reporting to the board of directors and the governing body of the organization. And essentially this means adopting a compliance management procedure with respect to the safeguarding of consumer data. Uh, now, this also has other bells and whistles, highly intricate, and, but very dramatically different than the existing safeguards rule. So the important thing is that organizations take steps to move to comply with this if they haven't, as well as incorporated in their vetting practices if there's counterparty risk. Now, we mentioned earlier at the top of the hour that the CFPB has made moves into 
um, examining a potentially risky non-bank organizations, uh, providers of financial services or their service providers that are not already presently under supervision and examination authority. Now, the CFPB enforces its uh, the federal financial laws two ways, through enforcement, as well as also through examination that could lead to enforcement or something short of that, like a memorandum of understanding or exam findings. Now, there's a set of organizations in various markets that are either statutorily or by rule already under exam authority by the CFPB, and the Bureau has always had the ability to uh, examine a risk, uh, risk based on a risk based approach organizations that pose a reasonable risk to consumers. The CFPB announced this week an intention to do so. It would be on a, essentially a case by case basis. They've also proposed, and it will become effective shortly, a rule change that will allow them to publish their findings when they're determining whether or not to bring a exam against a non bank that is not already covered. This does have confidentiality and reputation risk uh, elements to it. Um, but you know, when I said there were two ways the CFPB enforces its rules, there's also probably a third, which is the bully pulpit. And this is in part um, evidence of that, as well as also a very real substantive way the Bureau may be exercising its authority over organizations placing them in a completely different posture than they might otherwise be if they're not under routine examination already by a state or a federal regulator. The other initiatives that are out there that are important to know include a redlining initiative. It's a joint task force from the Department of Justice, CFPBs included in that and others, um, including state AGs. And importantly, uh, Director Chopra has particularly been focused on the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning and lending decisions. So organizations that are engaged in lead gen for consumer financial services and products need to take that into account because increasingly what we're seeing is lead gen, including AI and other decisioning. Now there's substantive requirements too under uh, the uh, ECOA as well as fair lending and UDAP when it comes to um, the advertising and marketing of financial products and services and going down to the image that's used. So on one hand, you have decisioning in the background with artificial intelligence and underwriting, and you also have facial uh, need uh, compliance as well if you're using any visuals or audio. Um, so you have to manage both risks. And I'll just close by saying that, you know, the, the CFPB issued a, a bulletin just a few weeks ago, essentially saying that, um, even unintentional discrimination um, in non-lending uh, contacts uh, can be considered an, unfair, an illegal, unfair practice um, under the Consumer Financial Protection Act, you know, completely separate from ECOA or other uh, fair lending um, statutes. And so the, you know, the CFPB has charged its examiners when looking, um, when examining uh, banks, non-bank providers of financial products, like bank accounts, servicing of those financial products, um, student loans, et cetera, to look for any intentional or non-intentional discrimination in how those um, services are offered, how they're advertised, and how they're serviced. And so um, it's important for both um, entities that, are, that generate leads or that purchase those leads from third parties to keep that on that checklist because it's an area that they're now going to be scrutinized for. And so with that, um, we've reached the end of our session. Um, we thank you very much for joining us. Should you have any questions that you couldn't get to during um, the presentation, feel free to email us. We appreciate it.